Thank you, Susan. That was obviously a joy who does not love that incredible institution, but to get a close look of the acquisition process and the obviously brilliancy of Mr. Frick is always a joy. Now, lastly, but of course, uh, very, very expected, our very own Michael Brown, who is the curator for European art at this museum five years ago, five years ago, and who uh, has devoted his expertise to painting in Spain and the Hispanic Americas, and author of numerous articles in Spanish portraiture and history of collecting Hispanic art. And uh, of course, it's uh, our wonderful privilege to have had him here in San Diego, analyzing our collection, revisiting catalogs, and being part of our acquisition program. We've been together acquiring lately for this institution paintings by Valdez Leal, Rivera, and, uh, and, and more. So Michael, what a privilege to, to have you here, to be with you for this exhibition. And I would ask, before you arrive, a big applause for all this exhibition, for the project and the programs that are surrounding such an amazing endeavor. <laughs> Michael Brown. <laughs> The privilege is all mine, I, I assure you. That was really such a lovely uh, welcome. Thank you all for being here. And uh, what a relief it must be to see me up here as your last, your last speaker. Thank you to Bailey. Thank you to Josh and his team. Thank you, Roxana. Thank you, Anita. This is really such a, a, a privilege to be a part of this exhibition and to be a part of this uh, great museum. Thank you all of the speakers whose uh, papers I, I'm just so humbled and honored to be able to follow all of you. This is really a remarkable day. So thank you. A round of applause for all of the speakers, please. Uh, there are a lot of people to thank, but I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, some of the people that have traveled great distances to be with us today from Philadelphia, from Florida, from uh, Orange County, from Los Angeles. Um, am I forgetting anyone, the speakers from all over the world, of course. Um, today I'm talking about something, well, this is sort of like East Coast to West Coast now as we discuss San Diego. I want to bring bring the program back to uh, San Diego and look at some unheralded uh, cultural ties between, between our city and our region and, uh, and Spain, specifically the south part, southern part of Spain, Andalusia. Southern California and San Diego in particular have a distinctly f Spanish feel, some of which is rooted in history and some of which exists only in the imagination. Claimed for the monarchy as, as a territory of the Kingdom of New Spain, which it remained until 1821 when it became part of a newly independent Mexico, Alta California was ceded to the United States of America in 1847. Historically, the Spanish presence in San Diego, the southernmost region of the state along the border with Mexico, dates to the 16th century. The Camino Real of the first Franciscans is still in use, and while we might see riders on horseback on certain quieter stretches of the road, most of us drive on its multiple lanes in our cars. Aesthetically, from the profusion of mission-style architecture, not to mention the missions, missions themselves, to the Mediterranean climate and rugged, arid, and mountainous terrain, the similarities to Andalusia, superficially at least, are undeniable. However, by identifying and examining the cultural connections between San Diego and Andalusia, some deeper connections become clear, supporting the growing body of recent scholarship, which has come up today, on the powerful but overlooked artistic and historical ties between uh, Spain and the US. Beyond the geographical similarities, a look into the shared architectural histories and the importance of Andalusian and other Spanish works of art in the permanent collection of the San Diego Museum of Art offer insights into the region's development and into patterns of American collecting. The first European to navigate San Diego Bay was Captain Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo in 1542, 
from the small town of Palma del Rio near Cordoba. However, the Spanish did not begin to settle Alta California in earnest until 1769, when the visitor general of New Spain, Jose de Galvez, you, who you see here, uh, sent Commander Gaspar de Portola and the Franciscan friar Junipero Serra to found the mission of San Diego de Alcala. Russian explorations of, Alta, of the Alta California coast uh, must have motivated Galvez to plan New Spain's northward expansion even before the mandate had arrived from the king. San Diego de, Al de Alcala was the first of the 21 Franciscan missions built between 1769 and 1833. I'm showing you some, an image of Palma del Rio where, um, where Galvez was from, alongside uh, two of the missions in San Diego County here. Mission San Diego features a whitewashed stucco facade and open frame bell tower, aspects which have striking parallels with parish churches throughout the south of Spain. Like this one. Supplied by Spanish galleons. There we go, another, another California mission, and just, just for comparison. Um, Supplied by Spanish galleons sailing up uh, the coast from Baja, California. Did that advance? No. Okay, that's what I wanted. Um, the settlement brought a new way of life to the indigenous Kumeyaay people, including farming, livestock, conversion to Christianity, but also the scourge of European disease and forced labor. Church furnishings and works of art, as well as grapevines, seeds, school materials, textiles, etc., for the first missions, arrived in Alta California via the coastal route. One document report records the Spanish sailor who, uh, who imported the first medicinal pepper tree seeds to Mission San Luis Rey, seen here, uh, from Peru. A single tree survives from the original planting at San Luis Rey, a large mission located in northwestern. San Diego County. Following Mexico's independence from Spain, San Diego saw modest uh, growth around its mission and uh, the Spanish Presidio, developing further only with the advent of the railroad in the later 19th century. The port of San Diego brought significant economic expansion following the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914. I think I need to skip a slide here. No, that, that's it. The Panama, California Exposition of 1915, uh, which you can see on the left here, celebrating the canal and global industry, took place in the recently de developed Balboa Park with Spanish revival buildings designed by Bertram Goodhue. Goodhue, along with uh, Julia Morgan, architect of Hearst Castle at San Simeon, California, was the foremost proponent of the Spanish revival style in the US. He drew on numerous inspirations from different periods in Spanish and viceregal architecture. Goodhue's Cabrillo Bridge, which leads into Balboa Park and is named for the aforementioned captain who charted the Bay of San Diego, is informed by the example of Trajan's Great Bridge over the Tagus River at Alcantara. Goodhue's ephemeral fantasies for the San Diego Exposition We'll see a couple of pictures here. Echoed various Spanish styles, as this brief series of general comparisons illustrates. We can see the California Tower here and the uh, Church of the Assumption, again in Palma del Rio, which we saw a little bit earlier. Whether he intended to or not, Goodhue charted the architectural history of southern Spain from Roman to Islamic to Renaissance and Baroque. He even revived the obscure design detail, the estipite uh, pilaster, which you see here in close up, uh, popular in Andalusia and the viceregal Americas in the mid 18th century. Slated for demolition following the expo, Goodhue's popular buildings instead were retrofit for permanent use, and the restored structures remain in use in Balboa Park 
today. You've all wandered through uh, some of Goodhue's buildings uh, over the course of the last two days and have gotten a feel for uh, his architectural fantasies. The architect of the, the Fine Arts Gallery of San Diego, William Templeton Johnson, designed the 1925 facade in a rather more sober Spanish style than Goodhue did. Johnson turned, turned to the platteresque of the 16th century, following the example of the University of Salamanca, seen here. And he would incorporate similar details into his designs for the American Pavilion at the Ibero-American Exposition held in Seville in uh, 1929. Here's a close-up of our facade. And the facade of his uh, building which still stands to this day in, in Seville. Two of his ephemeral structures in Seville were demolished, while the third, seen here, was converted into the United States consulate following the expo. During the expo, the pavilion housed exhibitions devoted to Spain's uh, now forgotten role in the history of the United States, its independence, displaying objects from the Smithsonian Institution and maps of the roots of the conquistadors, as well as a general history library. The prominence of the seal of the original 13 colonies of the Union, adapted from the Great Seal of the United States, which you can see right here, and on our, and on our facade, in both, both facades, indicates the importance of the cultural ties between Spain and the US, especially in the context of a World's Fair in Seville. Johnson's facade for uh, the San Diego, what is now known as the San Diego Museum of Art, not the Fine Arts Gallery, uh, features monumental sculptures of Zurbaran, Murillo, and Velazquez, seen here. The great artistic triumvirate uh, of Golden Age Seville, along with roundels depicting El Greco and Ribera on either side. American zeal for Spanish culture and arts was at a peak in the 1920s, following uh, along with Susan's uh, talk from the 1890s even. When Johnson began researching his architectural plans for the museum's original building, he turned to photographs and publications at, at the Hispanic Society of America in New York. The, the society's founder, Archer Milton Huntington, had underwritten the comprehensively illustrated catalogs of Spanish architecture and design by Arthur Bine and his wife, Mildred Stapley Bine, as well as the travel, the photography, and research undertaken by, by the couple in Spain. Huntington again proved instrumental to San Diego, uh, not only for his 1925 gift of Soroya's Maria at La Granja, the first work of art to enter the fledgling museum's permanent collection. He also provided the key reference for Reginald Poland when the museum was looking for its first director. Poland, who would go on to lead the museum from 1925 until 1950, uh, wrote in 1927 that the institution had, quote, as one of its principal policies, the development of a representative collection of Spanish art. Our permanent collection of Hispanic arts numbers over 300 objects from the medieval period to the late 20th century with its great, greatest strength uh, lying in the Siglo de Oro. In 1928, Poland acquired two Spanish painters from the New York dealer Eric Galleries. One of these, a portrait of Isabella Val Valois, thought to be by Alonso Sanchez Coelho, was later identified as a workshop copy and deaccessioned in 1987. While other early gifts and acquisitions, including works by Chardin, uh, Corot, and Courbet, as well as contemporary American painters, the powerful presence of Spanish art uh, from the outset was undeniable. The museum's principal benefactors, a a uh, Anne, Amy, and Irene Putnam, funneled their considerable inheritance into building an excellent collection of old masters at the Fine Arts Gallery of San Diego. The museum owns four important paintings by Francisco de Zurbaran, as Susan pointed out, more than any, any other institution in the US, along with major works by El Greco, Alonso Cano, uh, Murillo, Sanchez Cotan, his uh, undisputed masterpiece, of course, which we've, we've seen. In 1929, or in 1925, actually, uh, we acquired, uh, along with uh, 
the Soroya, this important gift which is in the exhibition of the, the uh, patent of nobility, this beautiful uh, illustrated page, uh, which was in the collection from the very, very initial days. But in 1929, the sisters provided the funds to acquire the museum's first Zerberon. The full-length full canvas of St. Jerome, circa 1640 to 50. The painting is of particular interest today as it seems likely to have served as a model for a number of copies and variants produced in the workshop for provincial churches throughout Andalusia and the Americas. Tying the work more closely uh, to its origins is the fact that Zurbaran portrayed the saint in the brown and white habit worn by contemporary Geronimite monks in Seville. Perhaps inspired by the sister's gift, the brothers William and Henry Timken bought Murillo's Mary Magdalene from Kleinberger Galleries in New York uh, in 1931. Spanish paintings continued to come into the collection in the 1930s, including several early Aragonese uh, and Castilian panels, as well as the important, important Goya portrait that continues to hang in the galleries today. In 1935, the museum, with funds from the Putnam sisters, was able to secure its first true masterpiece of the Golden Age, Zorbaran's Virgin and Child with St. John the Baptist, signed and dated uh, 1658, painted in Madrid. The date puts the work in the painter's late Madrid period, during which he reconnected with his old friend and colleague, Velazquez. Although executed in the capital, Zorbaran, as he often did, made a tip of the cap to Seville, uh, by including a traditional shawl from Niebla, uh, just outside the city uh, of Seville, draped over the Virgin's shoulder. The Putnam sisters added, um, I should point out here, um, Uh, the Putnams also gave the museum its first Velasquez here, a truly aspirational attribution to say the least, which again was deaccessioned. Uh, it's, um, I think everyone agrees that this was um, not by the hand of the master. Um, the Putnam sisters uh, added the, where is my El Greco? Oh, my El Greco disappeared. Um, anyway, uh, it's in the exhibition. You all know the painting. Uh, <laughs> the Putnam sisters added the penitent St. Peter by El Greco to the museum's collection in 1940, and its crown jewel, Sanchez Cotan's astounding still life in 1945. While these two artists are not typically identified with Andalusia, each made his own distinct impact on the development of painting there, with El Greco innovating the single apostle composition that formed the basis of Zorbaran and Ribera's uh, apostolados, and Sanchez Cotan exemplifying the naturalism that would come to define Velasquez Bodegones. Of course, the Sanchez Cotan has its own well-known history in the United States, having arrived with Joseph Bonaparte in Bordentown, New Jersey in 1816. Uh, this was one of the paintings that escaped uh, confiscation at the hands of the French that Gabriele discussed yesterday um, in an absolutely fascinating story. In the intervening years, uh, I mentioned the, the earlier Vel the Velasquez, uh, also a gift of the, of the uh, Putnams, which was deaccessioned. Um, in 1947, the Putnam sisters offered their final Spanish masterpiece uh, to the museum, Zorbaran's exquisite contemplation piece, the Agnes Dei, painted around 1638 to 40. As a still life a lo divino, uh, it serves as an instructive bridge between the devotional and the secular works in the collection. With the Putnams and director Reginald Poland out of the picture by 1950, the acquisition of Spanish paintings all but stopped. In 1957, an important work by the Granadan painter, sculptor, architect Alonso Cano entered the collection, followed in 1990 by two small but exquisite works on copper by El Greco and Sanchez Cotan, respectively, both acquired with proceeds from the 1987 deaccession of Putnam Gifts. Interest in acquiring Spanish art returned in earnest in 2012 
with the addition of Pedro de Mena's San Diego de Alcala, our, our, our namesake, the first Spanish polychrome wood sculpture to enter the collection. Born in Granada, Pedro de Mena worked closely with Alonso Cano before he moved to Malaga, where he formed a preeminent sculpture workshop. Recent acquisitions culminated in 2016 with Giuseppe de Ribera's St. Bartholomew of 1635. In the intervening years between 2012 and 2016, the museum also made three important acquisitions. Its first painting by uh, uh, Juan de Valdez Leal, here on the left. Uh, and the same year, the museum bought a beautiful Christ child by Juan de Mesa in his workshop, which included that uh, master of the master caster of lead children, Diego de Oliva. In 2014, local ph philanthropists Conrad Prebis and Debbie Turner acquired Zurbaran St. Francis in Prayer in a grotto, a late masterpiece, on behalf of the museum as an extraordinary and transformative gift. Finally, an engraving designed collaboratively by Peter Paul Rubens and Diego Velasquez, who we've seen this before today, earlier, um, recently acquired and is now on view for the first time. The subject of this major print, Gaspar de Guzman, the Count Duke of Olivares, was Philip IV's favorite, favorite uh, and prime minister. He was in also instrumental in helping elevate his younger fellow civilian, Velasquez, to his first royal position at the court in Madrid. The print is based on an oil sketch by Rubens in Brussels after a lost oil and drawing, which is now in Paris, by Velasquez. Following the deaccession of works by uh, Martinez del Maso and the one that I showed you of the Circle of Velasquez, this re recent acquisition is now the only work uh, with direct links to Velasquez in San Diego's permanent collection. To conclude, whether or not the museum's founders intended the presence of Velasquez, Murillo, and Zorbaran on the building's facade as an aspirational guide, the collection nonetheless evolved into one with distinct connections to Andalusia and the rest of Spain. As both architect and advisor, William Templeton Johnson played a key role in this endeavor, both through his close ties to Bertram Goodhue and Archer Huntington, and through his understanding of the importance of US-Spain cultural ties at this particular moment, historic moment, in the 1920s. Briefly exploring these parallels furthers our understanding of the relationships between San Diego and Spain, 20th century patterns of American collecting, as well as San Diego's place within the Hispanic world. Thank you very much.